at 3.30 in the morning. Tonight, we'll look back at late night deals, illegal tax credits, and job incentives that may not create any jobs. It's a failure in Central Florida. Plus, we'll score Clinton and Trump on their town hall performances, and John Wilson weighs in on the film industry and Florida's losing battle with Georgia. This is Money, Power, and Politics. So Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are both spinning their first town hall, and that's our first big point tonight because the reviews are in. First, for the way Matt Lauer conducted it. No, no, mm -mm. Mm -mm. no, 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 no. And the reviews are also in for Hillary Clinton and her prickly defensive tone. No, no. And the reviews are in for Donald Trump and all of his vague generalities and gushing praise of Vladimir Putin. No, God! No, God, please, no! No! Yeah, only Matt Lauer can focus much of a deep dive on military issues and foreign policy on a rehash of Clinton's email scandal. Only Clinton can squirm and stew in it and fail to redirect. And only Trump can say a secret plan to destroy ISIS involves apparently firing generals, then hiring new generals to come up with a new plan that may or may not conflict with his secret plan in his first 30 days. I have a substantial chance of winning. If I win, I don't want to broadcast to the enemy exactly what my but plan is. While praising a dictator who invades Ukraine. Well, he does have an 82% approval rating. And defends a mass murdering dictator in Syria and seems to have a way of making his critics disappear all for his leadership. No! Both Trump and Clinton's advisors may be cringing after what they saw last night. On spelling out her positive vision for the nation, you could give Hillary Clinton an F. On comfort and approach, you could give Clinton an F. On substance, you could give Trump an F. And it does not bode well for either of them as they head into their first debate on September the 26th. Again, if Gary Johnson could just nudge up in the polls, he could work his way onto the stage and throw yet another wrench in this wild race. Which brings us to our second big point. What's up with Johnson? Some of Johnson's supporters have repeatedly said we need to talk more about room. Gary Johnson, so we will. He certainly got a lot of people talking today because this week's Golden Doofus Award goes to Gary Johnson. What would you do if you were elected about Aleppo? About Aleppo. And what is Aleppo? You're kidding. No. That's one of the dumbest things I think I've ever seen. Play it again with my initial reaction. What would you do if you were elected about Aleppo? About Aleppo. And what is Aleppo? You're kidding. No. Yeah, play it again to the point Johnson learns about a critical world hotspot live on national TV. What would you do if you were elected about Aleppo? About Aleppo. And what is Aleppo? You're kidding. No. Aleppo is in Syria. It's the, uh, it's the epicenter of the refugee crisis. Okay, got it. Got it. Okay. That kind of reminds me of somebody. Oh, look, Frost. Yep, Johnson just committed the dumbest gaffe since Cruz and Kasich tried to team up in the primaries. I'm sick and tired of losing the primaries. Okay, Lloyd. Gary Johnson said that he's terribly, incredibly frustrated with himself and that he needs to get smarter on some things. He better, because at this point, his chances of winning the White House are only slightly better than if he had never been born. So you're telling me there's a chance. Okay, third big point. Okay, the first, first one was the town hall reviews are in. Second one was Johnson looking ridiculous. Um, hey, hey, third one, can you, Rick, can you help me out there? It's three agencies of government when I get there that are gone. Commerce, education, and the, um, uh, what's the third one there? Let's see. <laughs> the third agency of government, yeah. I, would, I would do away with the education, uh, the... Uh, <laughs> Commerce. I, I, commerce. And let's see. I can't. The third one, I can't. Sorry. <laughs> Oops. Yep, third big point. Big slips are hard to live down. Remember, Rick Perry crashed by spacing out on national TV, and he could never bounce back from that. Well, Gary Johnson is now facing the same challenge. And just when he needed to make a positive move in the polls to try to work his way into the debate. He can only hope more people saw Trump and Clinton flounder last night than saw him stumbling around this morning.
Okay, beyond the candidates, we also drill into government policy to take a critical look at our job and tax programs and what's working and not working and what it's all costing us. So since it's Thursday, let's do a little throwback Thursday on what we found. I'm trying to grow the state by adding jobs. 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 Our governor and legislature dangle big tax breaks for jobs. Sometimes our lawmakers don't even read what they pass. We're here at 3.30 in the morning. I don't know the substance of this house bill. In 2011, they passed a tax incentive in the middle of the night. And now years later, we can't find a single new job that it created. And a state spokeswoman told us Florida is not even keeping track. It's a failure in Central Florida. On another note, we discovered the state granted tax credits under another program by mistake. I had no idea that we also had businesses that were outside of uh, the boundaries and the lines that are uh, benefiting from these tax credits. And we also found tax incentives for farms that don't look much like farms. Is the <laughs> farm back behind those woods? No, this is the farm. This is, this is what's supposed to be uh, pine tree farm. Yeah, the state has given a lot of breaks that have burned taxpayers with questionable results. And at the same time, the state has neglected incentives for the film industry. We'll show you how that may have already backfired in just a couple of minutes. But first, I want to come back to Hillary Clinton because campaign strategists pay attention to shifts in the polls and optics. And that appears to be driving some interesting changes this week in Hillary Clinton's approach. She had been sitting on a lead and trying to run out the clock. But notice, since the race tightened this week, she's spending much more time answering reporters' questions. And she even said her advisor told her to do this. I'll come back later. <laughs> Jenna's convinced me I need to. <laughs> Yesterday you was so bad. Right? You oh, weren't no. it, was great. it was great. I love having the plane. The plane makes everything so much easier. And uh, that's what we used to do in the State Department all the time. It was just so simple. Everybody in one place. So I will come back in uh, about an hour. And look at how she's answering questions on the plane, just as the president or busy world leaders are often seen doing. She's trying to look presidential while claiming that Trump cannot and should not be president. And that is the stagecraft of politics. But there are a lot of other things that the strategist simply cannot control. And in the second half of our show, we'll show you how a September or October surprise could shake up the race. That follows our focus on state tax policy and our losing battle with Georgia. Coming up, we'll show you how Florida is losing out on big business from show business and why the state of Georgia is eating our lunch. John Wilson weighs in with his view. You may have seen Ricky Wayne on TV or in the movies, but this Tampa actor mostly works in two states you may not expect. The majority of this stuff is in Atlanta and New Orleans, where they have a really robust incentive. Well, Florida has also had a thriving film and TV industry, but casting directors like Catherine Laughlin say it's withering because Georgia and Louisiana now offer better tax deals for film and TV projects. This is supposed to be our busy season. No one's busy. It's really dead. We're usually packed with commercials. No more. It's gone. And with that, stunt people, producers, actors, and production people are moving away. I've had as many as seven at a time pull up and move to Louisiana. They're leaving for Georgia. You just gave me my half of the money that you made off those books? Of course, Florida still has a lot of actors who want to stay, but performers like Kristen Wallace say the film bonanza to our north is making it hard. The shift came really drastically, honestly, from really being able to work here and wake up every morning here to now flying to all of these other states. Georgia offers a tax credit of up to 30% if the productions include that Georgia Peach logo you see in the closing credits of films. Georgia figures it's better to have 70% of something than 100% of nothing, which brings us now to some straight talk from John. This is John Wilson's My View Now. All right, let's bring in John Wilson, My View Now. Thank you once again. Hello, Greg. You know a thing or two about film with your family, your business ventures. What are state leaders thinking or not thinking in offering incentives as Georgia, Louisiana, and other states do for film? Uh, let me tell you, this is catastrophic for, for the film industry and also for 
for those of us in Florida who want to see a developed uh, state that's portrayed in movies, uh, remember like Miami Vice for so many years, uh, and all these other movies that have made Florida a part of the story. Well, what's happened now is you've got the state taking a position that the return on the investment is just 43 cents for every dollar. Well, the film industry comes back and says, wait a minute, what numbers are you using? The, well, the numbers they're using are direct sales tax receipts. That's what they're using. Well, there's much more to this than that. There's, there are 170,000 jobs. There are $900 million. There's 4.1 billion to the state's economy. Uh, th those are the numbers the film industry puts out. So you see, these sides have got to get together here before, and they let the money run out, as you know. They let the money run out, and it was, uh, what was it, 900 and, it was 969 million. Almost a, almost a, a billion dollars they let run out over a three-year term rather than for six years. But that, their mistake there was that they allocated that money to movie production. Uh, uh, Dolphin Tail was one of them, many others, a dozen others, but they let the money go on a first come, first served basis. There was no money left, it was all used up. And when you bring in film and induce film work into your region, you mentioned Miami Vice, it's transformative. It goes beyond the dollars and cents because if I recall, Miami Beach was on the ropes in the early 1980s. <laughs> it, was. it was not what we know it today. It took Miami Vice to come along to bring it from where it was That's to what true. we know today. That is very true. That's a really, that's a, it, a lot of the value of movie production is the intrinsic value of it. And it takes a period of time for all of that to evolve and to play out. But l look at what we're gonna see coming up in movies now. A movie featuring MacDill Air Force Base. Is it shot in Tampa? No, it's gonna be shot in California. A movie featuring Ybor City. Is it shot in Tampa? No, that's gonna be shot in Brunswick, Georgia. A movie, sh uh, it goes on and on. They're relocating away from Florida because we have no money to help them produce these movies here. If we started offering money, could it be too late? Look, I'm going to Georgia. I went on a film tour. It's everywhere. And on this tour, you see so-and-so already lives here. This director moved here. You already have a hub in place of actors, performers, directors, stage crew who are already living in Atlanta, living in South Carolina, living in Louisiana. Is it too late now for Florida to capitalize on film when you have other states already eating our lunch the way they are? Well, it's never too late. I wouldn't take that approach, but I would say it's a, gonna be a long time in coming back because these other states have such a head start on us now. Georgia, Louisiana, uh, Canada has got a head start on all of us. And we're talking about the money tax incentives. We're talking about up to 40% of the budget for a movie is provided by the state of Louisiana. We, we can't provide 1%. Why can't we do that? Because our money is, our, our income in Florida is on sales tax of tourism. Well, guess what? Louisiana needed tourism. They, that was an incentive for them. We, after Hurricane Elena, we need tourism. Georgia was the same thing. So, so is South Carolina and these other states. The very thing that is an incentive for, for a state to become involved is tourism and sales tax revenue. We already have that. That's our basic economy here. Well, the push has also been singular from Governor Scott. Jobs, jobs, jobs. How many times has he said it? A Repeatedly. Lot. And with this, you have an industry that can bring a lot of jobs to the region that Florida is not pursuing. Yeah, uh, I think movie production during that four-year term that uh, $969 million was spent generated 700,000 jobs. They're gone now. Gone. John. And they're not coming back. Thank you yes, for sir. your insight. Yep. Coming up, see how WikiLeaks is trying to damage Hillary Clinton by dribbling more leaks in the coming weeks. And this World War II pilot drove some big changes in the government's burial policy for veterans. Well, WikiLeaks is planning a pre-election surprise. The WikiLeaks founder, Julian Assange, says that he'll release another batch of Hillary Clinton's emails. We don't know the contents, but we do know that Assange is trying to damage her just before the election. American liberal press uh, in falling over themselves uh, to defend Hillary Clinton are erecting a demon uh, that is going to put nooses around everyone's necks uh, as soon as she wins the election, which he is almost certainly going to do. 
He obviously appears to have it out for Hillary Clinton. Remember, the administration launched a criminal investigation of WikiLeaks while Hillary Clinton served as the Secretary of State. And Assange, who has a long history of leaking sensitive information, says that he does have more on Clinton and will dribble it out as the race heats up. We might put out some teasers as early as the next week or the week after. And remember, WikiLeaks obtained and then leaked the emails that showed Democratic Party bosses putting their thumbs on the scales in the primaries, appearing to favor Hillary Clinton over Bernie Sanders. And that, among other things, drove the ouster of Debbie Wasserman Schultz as chairwoman of the DNC. Remember, Trump crashed after the conventions, but as email woes dogged Hillary Clinton and he's shown more discipline, Trump has narrowed that gap to around three points in the polls. And the more Clinton emails come to light, the more it puts her on defense and works to Trump's advantage. Please check out our YouTube channel for a breakdown of the email controversy and how it has affected the race so far. Search for Craig Patrick's Money, Power and Politics and click subscribe. We also have extended interviews and breakdowns of the key swing states. Coming up, our government banned women Air Force service pilots from burials at Arlington National Cemetery. But the story of Elaine Harmon drove change. The federal government has changed its burial policy at Arlington National Cemetery, and the veteran who drove that change was just laid to rest. And Laura Evans has her story. Dozens of family and friends gather graveside at Arlington National Cemetery to bury Elaine Harmon. Her ashes laid to rest with military honors. It was a burial Harmon's family had to fight for, a proper burial they say she deserves. Harmon died last year at the age of 95. During World War II, she proudly served in a group known as the WASPs, the Women Air Force Service Pilots, flying military aircraft on non-combat missions to free up the men for combat. Harmon's granddaughter, Erin Miller, talked about her grandmother on Fox Morning News back in March. My grandmother's mission was to train male pilots on instrument training uh, specifically. Harmon's family had planned to bury her ashes at Arlington, but a few weeks before Harmon died last year, Army officials decided wasps were no longer eligible for burial at Arlington. The Army Secretary at the time, John McHugh, said wasps should never have been eligible in the first place. Harmon's family fought back. An Associated Press article about the family's campaign prompted widespread criticism of the Army. A petition then followed, and then in May, President Barack Obama signed legislation allowing wasps to be buried in Arlington. She was very proud to serve her country, and she was very patriotic. And so, more than a year after her death and a battle that ended on the U.S. president's desk, Elaine Harmon is buried with honors. Aaron Miller said the family has already grieved. This burial is about closure. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel for full investigations, extended interviews, and prior shows you may have missed. Search for Craig Patrick's Money, Power, and Politics on YouTube and click subscribe at the top of the page. That's our show. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again tomorrow night.